welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this first, uh, really, as Malar said, like hybrid lecture. Uh, so I'm uh, Frédéric Saint-Ange. I'm a fourth year PhD student in Sylvia Villeneuve's lab. And uh, it is today my pleasure to welcome Dr. Marianne Chaplot, uh, who is a Villeneuve lab alumni as well. So it's, uh, it's really uh, my pleasure to welcome her. So Dr. Chaplot is a clinical neuropsychologist and po postdoctoral scholar at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center in the RAB lab led by Gil, Dr. Gil Rabinovici. She completed a BSc degree in psychology and a PhD degree in clinical neuropsychology at the University of Montreal. She received dual training in clinical neuropsychology and neuroimaging research. Her research interests include age-related uh, neurodegenerative diseases, neuropathology, and uh, multimodal neuroimaging, mostly with PET and MRI, as well as uh, LT aging. Her postdoctoral project aims to better understand the impact of copathology burden on the brain and cognition of patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, uh, Dr. Chaplot agreed to stay for a student discussion at the end of the talk. Uh, so for those who are interested to ask more questions uh, that couldn't ask during the talk, feel free to uh, stick around. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, just a reminder to please keep your microphone muted. If you have a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand or uh, send me a, a quick chat message. Uh, and Marianne, do you prefer to take questions uh, during the talk or uh, at the end or at some point during the presentation? Um, I think at the end would be best. Uh, I think my presentation should last about like 45 to 50 minutes. So we probably will have like 10 or more minutes to um, take questions. Would that, would that be okay? Yeah, that sounds good. So just, uh, so if you have questions during the talk, uh, just put them in the chat. Uh, or raise your hand at the end of the talk, and then I can either read your questions on the chat or uh, simply assign you uh, the, the the right to talk. I don't like to say it like that, but anyway. Uh, so if there's anything, uh, feel free to let me know. And then uh, the floor is yours, Marianne. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fred, for the um, very kind introduction. Well, first off, hi, everyone. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here today and have the opportunity to share my work with you all. Um, I don't know if, if you know, but I'm originally from Montreal. And uh, it's funny because I've been feeling a little homesick lately. And so obviously this is not an in-person presentation, but I kind of feel like I'm a little closer to home uh, by giving this presentation. So thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Um, and on that note, uh, since I started my postdoc about a year and a half ago now, um, my goal has been mainly to try and better understand the impact of copathologies in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this is mainly what I'm going to talk about today. So as you may know, Alzheimer's disease is really a pathological process that is characterized by the abnormal accumulation of both amyloid and tau proteins. Um, and so this pathological process is independent of the presence and nature of cognitive deficits. Um, that said, the presence of copathologies is very, very frequent in Alzheimer's disease. And over the last decade, there's many, many studies that have shown how the presence of multiple pathologies can increase cognitive decline and even accelerate cognitive decline. But still to this day, little is known about how these copathologies um, are related to specific um, um, phenotypes in AD, specific symptoms, and how they can be detected in vivo. So there's different phenotypes associated with IC Alzheimer's disease. The most frequent one, the one that you hear about um, most often in the news, um, um, the amnestic variant, or sometimes called the typical variant of AD, um, predominantly includes memory impairment. But there's also um, less common variants of AD that are also present, um, including posterior cortical atrophy, which mainly involves visual impairments, behavioral AD, which includes behavioral and personality changes, the legopinic variant of, uh, of primary progressive aphasia, which include language um, dysfunctions, uh, this executive AD, which tar targets executive functioning, so planification, organization, inhibitory control, and so on. And lastly, cortical basal syndrome, which includes motor changes. Um, obviously, keep in mind that patients don't always fit in these boxes. So sometimes you can have patients that present with mixed presentations, but these diagnostic categories are very helpful for clinicians because they allow to better understand um, what symptoms were present at least in the beginning of the disease and kind of explain um, um, the brain dysfunction that, that is being seen. 
Um, so since I started my postdoc a year and a half ago, I mainly focused on these two variants of AD. And so this is kind of what I'm, I'm going to focus on today. But keep in mind that the research questions I'm interested in can also be interesting to take a look at in these other variants of AD. Another question that remains to be answered is if we have um, specific tools that can allow us to detect these co-pathologies in vivo. Um, so unfortunately, to this day, we don't have, for instance, a, a, a specific biomarker that allows us to detect TDP43 pathology in vivo. Um, um, in the years and, and probably decade to come, this is something that we're going to see as a new exciting and, and many biomarkers are being developed at the moment. Um, uh, it's probably going to be something that will um, uh, be able to, to quantify uh, in the years to come. But for now, we kind of have to deal with the tools that we have. And um, the goal of my postdoc project is to see if uh, FDG PET can allow us to detect these copathologies uh, in vivo. So this is the technique that I'm going to focus on um, during my talk today. So the general goal of my postdoctoral research is to better understand the relationships between clinical presentations, so AD-related syndromes, especially the atypical variants of AD, in vivo markers and pathological findings. And so to do so, I'm leading two main projects. Um, in the first one, we're quantifying demographic, clinical, biomarker, and neuropathological correlates in um, um, and posterior cortical atrophy. So this is a multi-site study. Um, and in the second project, we're trying to better understand the impact of co-pathology on the FDG PET patterns and cognitions of patients with uh, pathology-proven Alzheimer's disease. So first, I'm going to talk about the first project on posterior cortical atrophy. So this is really a team effort. Uh, there's 34 different sites involved in this project. Um, and the main PIs involve Gil Rabinovich here at UCSF. Uh, Kerry Young, uh, Rico Sankopili, and Victoria Pelak. So posterior cortical atrophy is a clinically defined syndrome that is characterized by impairment and higher order visual processing. In its pure form, the patient fulfilled the criteria for um, 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 PCA, which includes visual and other posterior functions. Um, and in its plus form, the patient fulfilled uh, the core diagnostic features for PCA, but also for another neurodegenerative disease, such as dementia with Lewy body, cortical basal syndrome, etc. We know from previous studies that the most common underlying pathology is Alzheimer's disease, but large-scale biomarker and neuropathological studies are still lacking uh, because most studies on PCA, since it's uh, a very rare disease, had unfortunately small sample sizes and were conducted kind of, uh, kind of a while ago. So the goal of this project was really to kind of have an update on PCA syndrome in general and especially focus on the underlying pathology. So our goal here was to describe demographic, clinical, biomarker, and neuropathological correlates in uh, PCA using an international cohort. And so to do so, I contacted 55 research centers that we knew were conducting PCA research, and I, I identified these um, research centers through a literature review. And we also uh, recruited seven additional sites with the help of the ISTART atypical ADPIA. And the inclusion criteria were very simple. Uh, basically, patients needed to have received the diagnosis of PCA. And uh, we asked sites to provide um, biomarkers, so it, either PET or CSF or autopsy data. And then we looked at single subject demographic, clinical, fluid, neuroimaging, and neuropathological variables. Uh, keep in mind that for most of these variables, we included the cutemous variables. So for instance, for um, MRI, we didn't ask the sites to provide the actual raw images. We just asked sites, um, do the does the patient uh, has a predominant, a predominant atrophy in the posterior parietal regions, yes or no? And then um, that's kind of the, the qualitative information we, we, um, we acquired through this project. So in terms of analyses, I looked at the prevalence of demographic and clinical data. Uh, so that includes the 16 core diagnostic features per crutch and uh, colleagues in 2017. Um, I included MMSC and CDR scores, uh, 
I looked at other the other cognitive domains that were affected, et cetera. Um, in, turn, in terms of imaging, um, I looked at PET, CSF, MRI, and that, that spec positivity. And in terms of pathology, I included the main pathological diagnosis. And uh, the, I also looked at the presence of other common neuropathologies that I will show you in the slides to come. And then I computed association between all of these variables. So we collected individual patient data in 1,121 participants from 34 different sites across uh, 16 different countries. So as you can see here, uh, almost 50% of our sample uh, came from the United States, but I think we, we had a pretty good um, um, diversity in terms of country representation, in terms of the other countries that were included in this sample. So I think this, this sample is pretty diverse um, in terms of geographic representation. So what we found first, as expected, was that PCA was more frequent in female participants. Um, as you can see here on the right, 60% of our sample were females. Um, and this has been shown in other studies. Um, and now you're probably asking yourself, why is PCA more frequent in female participants? Um, one hypothesis that has been proposed is that um, females in general are more vulnerable to having um, um, the visual uh, uh, brain network being uh, uh, affected. Um, and so when Alzheimer's disease presents itself, uh, if you, these brain networks are, are vulnerable, this is uh, the symptomatology that is going to emerge. Um, and the reason people believe that is because there are a few studies that have shown that um, during schooling, um, girls will have, uh, um, uh, compared to boys, um, um, more prevalence of dyscalculia. So then when people age, that could be the kind of same process that, that happens in the brain. Um, but this is just a theory um, um, that um, is, is worth continuing to, to explore in the, in the years to come. We also found that PCA is an early onset syndrome. So as you can see here on the right, the mean age at the first symptoms was 60 years old. Again, nothing new here. This has been shown in previous studies, but it's interesting to see that in a very large and diverse sample, this is also what we find. It is a mostly pure presentation. So 81% of our sample received a diagnosis of PCA pure. But that said, almost all patients, uh, so 95% of our sample, had at least one other cognitive domain that was affected at the first diagnostic visit. Um, the most frequent one being behavior, followed by non-visual language and speech, executive functions, and memory. I think that this finding is very interesting because it shows that even PCA is not uh, uh, that pure in terms of, of uh, its presentation. And the fact that behavior was the one that was the most um, prevalent, I thought was very surprising. Um, and then I asked myself, you know, is it just anxiety? Is it just depression? Um, we don't know. So this is something that we're exploring in, in other studies um, at the moment. If we look now at individual symptoms, um, the results we found were very coherent with what was found in the meta-analysis from Crutch and colleagues in 2017. And so the most frequent symptoms were constructional dyspraxia, space perception deficit, simultagnosia, and acalculia. Now, if we look at the pathology, we found that AD uh, was by far the most common underlying pathology. So as you can see here, 92% of our sample had underlying, and this is out of 146 patients, had underlying Alzheimer's disease. And I think this finding is very interesting because if we compare with logopenic variant of PPA and uh, even the amnestic variant of Alzheimer's disease, the prevalence is a little lower. So if we take am uh, amnestic Alzheimer's disease, uh, and the amnestic variant of Alzheimer's disease, um, Alzheimer's disease is the pathology, pathology underlying the symptoms in about 76% of patients. And for LVPPA, it's even lower, it's about 70%. So this result kind of shows us that PCA seems to be the um, AD related syndrome that is most um, uh, um, uh, indicative of the presence of underlying AD pathology. So I think this is, this is very interesting. So basically what this means concretely is that if you see a patient with PCA, uh, the chances are that Alzheimer's disease is the underlying pathology are very, very high. Um, if we look more closely at AD pathology, 
Um, we looked at tall phases and Serrat score um, to look at amyloid and then uh, drag staging for tau. So first, if we start with amyloid using tall phases, so tau allows us to, tall phasing allows us to look at the distribution of all amyloid plaques. And we can see that 82% of our sample were at tall phase five. So that means that at this point, um, amyloid is really uh, present throughout the cortex. And so our patients were pretty advanced in terms of tall phasing. And another measure we have to quantify amyloid deposition is uh, the Serrat score. So the Serrat score allows us to look at the maximal density of neurotic plaques across cortical area. So here you're not looking at the localization of pathology, but the um, um, density of neurotic plaques. And again, we can see um, that our patients had a lot of neurotic plaques. So 84% receive a Serrat score of uh, frequent. Um, in a similar fashion, if we look at tau pathology using BRAC staging, which is another uh, measure that allows us to look at the uh, uh, topogra topographical progression of pathology, we can see that 83% of our sample uh, received a score of um, BRAC stage 6. So they were pretty advanced in terms of AD pathology. That said, co-pathologies were very frequent. So 85% of our sample had at least one other uh, copathologies present in their brain. The most frequent copathologies were Lewy body disease, vascular brain injuries, CAA, and AGD, so argyroflex brain disease. Um, we also found that amyloid negativity using CSF, and it was almost positive using PET, uh, was related to higher prevalence of plus symptoms. Um, so amyloid negativity Activity could be a, a good marker um, that is indicative of the presence of non-AD pathology. Um, so in conclusion, we found that PCA most commonly presents in the sixth and early seven decades of life, and this is even more true in females versus males. We also found that uh, the PCA pure syndrome is highly predictive of underlying AD pathology. That said, copathologies are very frequent. So yes, AD explains um, uh, a lot about the symptomatology in PCA, but there's also high prevalence of argyroflic brain disease, Lewy body disease, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and vascular uh, brain injuries. As I mentioned earlier, we also found that 95% of our sample had at least one other cognitive domain that was impaired, and 77% of them had uh, behavioral symptoms. So this is something I found really interesting, and we're um, uh, digging into a little bit more detail in, in another study. Um, and we're also exploring fine-grained neuroimaging patterns um, to better understand the prognosis of, of patients with PCA. Because I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, in this study, we didn't actually uh, include the raw MRIs, uh, but this is something that we're uh, taking a look, a look at in, in another study, um, and we're looking at the data longitudinally. Um, so that was it for the first project. Um, now I will talk about the second project. Um, so again, this is a very collaborative effort. effort. Um, we're lucky to have um, to be able to work with the pathology team here at the Memory and Aging Center. Um, so that includes Bill Silly, Leah Greenberg, and Salvatore Espina. And for this project, again, I'm, I'm very grateful to have the mentor mentorship and supervision of Renaud Lajoie and Gil Rabinovich. Um, and in this project, we're looking at the association of FDG-PET with co-pathologies in uh, autopsy-proven AV. So just a little bit of background, as I mentioned earlier, there's no direct in vivo biomarker at the moment that allows us to detect pathologies other than AD. But that said, FDG-PET is a good marker that allows to detect altered neuronal activity that is thought to be due to neurodegeneration. And um, when we look at a FDG-PET scan, uh, we're looking for the cold spots. So the regions that you see that are bluer on these scans are the regions that are more hypometabolic uh, at the group level compared to controls. And so here you can see in the scan um, of the control group, there is good glucose retention across the whole cortex. So the regions are, are pretty yellow. And if we compare here with the scan uh, for the Alzheimer's disease group, you can see hypometabolism in the temporal and posterior parietal brain areas. And so this is kind of the typical um, hypometabolism signature that we see at the group level in Alzheimer's disease patients. 
If we compare with Lewy body disease patients, we can see that there's also hypometabolism in the occipital regions. And we often see what we call the cingulate island sign in Lewy body uh, uh, dementia. And so this is the relative preservation of this region, this region that you see here, which is the posterior cingulate gyrus compared to the cuneus and precuneus. Um, so this relative preservation of the posterior cingulate gyrus is often seen at the group level in patients with Lewy body dementia. And so the hypothesis is that if you see a patient, for instance, that has an uh, Alzheimer's disease and that kind of shows this um, classical pattern of hypometabolism, but on top of that, they have hypometabolism in the occipital region and they show, for instance, the cingulate island sign, that could be indicative, this additional hypometabolism in these regions could be indicative of the presence of um, a, a Lewy body disease as a co-pathology. So this is kind of the goal of this project. We want to look at uh, if we can detect co-pathologies using FDG-PET and not just Lewy body disease, but we're also interested in, interested in other common neuropathologies. So our goal here was really to verify how and where in the brain uh, the presence of common neuropathologies So we included 55 patients with pathology proven AD. So what does that mean in terms of pathology uh, terminology? This means that we included patients with intermediate to high Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit what that means. So ADNC is really a composite measure uh, that allows to quantify amyloid and tau. Um, so in the, the calculation of ADN, ADNC score, we include tau phases, BRAC stages for tau, and SERAD score again for amyloid. And then each score for all of these uh, phasing or staging is converted into an ABC score, as you can see here. And then uh, uh, we can use that little table on the right. So if you have those information available, you know, you know um, what stage uh, uh, was the patient in terms of TAL, in terms of BRAC, and what CIRAD score they received, you can calculate their ADNC score uh, using this table here on the right. And so basically to receive an ADNC score of intermediate to high, patient need to have at least some amyloid present in their brain and to have at least uh, BRAC stage three. And then this is considered to be an adequate explanation of the cognitive impairment uh, or dementia. And then on the uh, pathology um, uh, 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 diagnosis, you'll see primary or contributing um, um, on, the, on the record. We also included 185 controls. Um, um, and when I looked at the pathological variables of interest, I looked at both uh, diagnosis. So basically, was the pathology present, yes or no? And then if the pathology was present in one patient, I gave it a score of one. If it was not present, I gave it a score of zero. And then if I had staging available for that pathology, I also looked at that. And so we had staging available for amyloid tau, so amyloid using tall phases for tau using BRAC stages. And I also had uh, staging available for uh, CAA and um, um, for uh, LDD. Um, so I included amyloid, tau, Lewy body disease, limbic predominant age-related TDP43 uh, neuropathological change, so latency, um, hippocampal sclerosis, gyrophilic brain disease, vascular brain injury, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, uh, aging-related tau astrogliopathy, and lastly, argyrophilic thorny astrocyte clusters. Um, and then I computed composite scores uh, to look at cognition, so composite scores for memory, for executive functions, for language, and for visual spatial functions. So basically, I looked at the neuropsychological assessment that was done uh, uh, closest to um, when they received the FDG PET scan. So just a few words about the pre-processing steps. So how did I do the neuroimaging analysis? Well, first I retrieved the raw FDG PET images, and then these images were warped to a template, smoothed, and included in a gray matter mask. And then I uh, quality checked the output for all of these steps. 
um, we had to let go of uh, five image, to five scans total, so four controls and one patient. Um, and I'm showing you here on the right an example of why we excluded a scan. So for these images, uh, they were showing what we called a field of view cuts. So as you can see here, there's a big portion of the cortex that is missing. Um, and so this is the reason why we uh, excluded a few, uh, a few scans. And then what I did is that I created, I created W maps for all patients compared to controls. Um, so basically W scores are Z scores that are adjusted for age, sex, and scanner type. So why did I want to control for age, sex, and scanner type? Uh, the answer is simple. It's because when we looked at controls, we saw that these variables had an effect in controls. As you can see here, there's a pretty big effect of age in our control group. And I really wanted to isolate uh, and look at the unique effect of copathologies on the FDG pet pattern. And so I didn't want to include these nuisance variables in my model. And so that's why I controlled for age, sex, and, and scanner type. So here I'm just showing you a little bit uh, um, more about the steps of how we created the W maps, and so I'll, I'll kind of guide you through the steps. The first thing um, we did was that we estimated the effect of nuisance variables and controls. Um, so here I'm showing you uh, um, the steps. So first we included the images for our sample of 180, 185 controls. And so again, these images were smoothed, warped, and uh, masked. And so these are the images I included in my model. And then they were included in a multiple regression model in SPM. And so just a few few words about the formula. So Y is the dependent variable, which is the, the metabolism value. Uh, B0 is the metabolism value when all the other covariates are equal to zero. So this is the intercept. And then B1, B2, and B3 are the slopes for the nuisance variables. Um, and so for instance, the slope for age is the change in metabolism when there is an increase of one unit in age. Um, and then same thing for the other variables, and we include also the error. And that allows, uh, allowed us to uh, compute uh, B maps. And so B maps are basically the visual representation of that multiple regression model. Um, and so this is B0, B1, B2, B3. And then what we did is that we extracted the residual maps um, from these B maps. And so the residual maps are what remains in terms of metabolism pattern when you regress out these nuisance variables. And then the last step was that we uh, uh, calculated the standard deviation for these four residuals. And this is the final output image that uh, we use in the calculation of W scores in patients. And so now, uh, if we take a look at how we calculated W scores in patients, again, we uh, masked, warped, and smoothed the uh, images of our AD sample in the same fashion that we did for the controls here. And then to calculate W score, basically we took the value uh, for let's say uh, 81 patient minus his, its predicted value for the same patient. And we divided by the standard deviation of residual in controls as you can see here. And then that allowed us to um, um, calculate the W score maps uh, in all of our 55 AD patients. And so here I'm showing you just for fun the, the difference between a warped, smooth, and masked SUVR image compared to its uh, equivalent W map. And so again, when we're looking at the FDG PET scan, we're looking for the cold spots. So as you can see, for instance, here, these brain areas are pretty hypometabolic. And then if you look at the uh, W map here, it's the other way around. So the regions that are the most hypometabolic are brighter. Um, so when we look at a W map, it's really the, the inverse of what we look at when we look at uh, FDG PET scan. So the regions that are the brighter here are the regions that are the most hypometabolic. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this, it's that sometimes it's a little confusing. When we're used to seeing FDG PET scans, we're looking for the cold spots. But really, when we look at a W map, it's the other way around. Um, the regions that are uh, the more bright are the regions that are the most hypometabolic. Uh, 
So in, term, in terms of a statistical analysis, I did basically four different things. I'm just going to focus on the three first steps uh, that I, I did in terms of statistical analysis, um, because in terms of cognition, I still have work to do um, to create my composite score. So I, I wasn't comfortable sharing the results today, but stay tuned, I, I will have results for cognition uh, very soon. Um, so the first thing I did was that I looked at voxel-wise correlations between the W maps. Uh, so the W maps are, are dependent variables, and then all pathologies uh, uh, as independent variables separately. So for instance, I wanted to look at the unique effect of Lewy body disease while controlling for the presence of all other pathologies, but also age, sex, time between FDG and death, and scanner type. And then I did the same thing. I, I, I repeated this step for all pathologies to see the unique effect of all pathologies. And then for the variables which I had staging available, I also looked at that. I basically did the same thing, but for uh, staging variables. So I did that for BRAC staging, for LBD, two different ways, and for CAA. And then I looked at the correlations um, uh, between the mean SUVR values in specific regions of interest. Um, and cognitive scores and the presence of pathologies. I will discuss a little bit more uh, um, the, the rationale between, behind why, why I, I did that. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. So here on the left, I'm showing you the demographics and clinical information in our sample. So if we take a look first at the demographics, you can see that the patients were pretty young um, when they received their PET scan on average. So the mean age was about 64 years old. We had a little bit more males in our sample. So 55% of them were male. And the patients were pretty advanced in terms of um, uh, disease stage. So um, um, usually when we see a, a global CDR score of one, it means that they're at the dementia stage. And here the mean was 0 0.8. So they were almost all at the dementia stage and the mean MMSC was 21.1, so they were pretty impaired. If we look at the clinical diagnosis at the PET visit, uh, it was pretty diverse. Half of them received the diagnosis of AD, but then uh, there was uh, heterogeneity in terms of the um, diagnosis that was given in vivo at the time of the PET. Um, now, if we look, we look at uh, the pathological information, we can see that all of them had amyloid and tau, obviously, because we included only patients with intermediate, intermediate to high ADNC. And you can see that they were pretty advanced in terms of amyloid, in terms of tau. Um, and all the patients had arterial low sclerosis. So I didn't include that pathology in my, in my model because there was no variability. They all had that. Um, and then CAA was pretty frequent, so presenting 84% of our sample and was mostly mild. Um, so incidental, our gerophilic grain disease was again uh, pretty common and was mostly lim uh, limbic. Um, Lewy body disease was uh, present in 46% of our sample and was kind of um, um, heterogeneous in terms of the precise localization. So some of them were limbic, some of them were diffuse, uh, some of them had the amygdala predominant uh, variant, and some of them were non-conforming. Um, vascular brain injuries were present in 46% of our sample. Uh, our TAG was also pretty frequent, so present in 40%. And then ATAC, latency, and hippocampal sclerosis were a little less common. And latency um, was uh, only present when it was in, in the hippocampus. Um, so now here on the right, I'm showing you the mean hypometabolism pattern in our sample of 80 patients compared to controls. And what we can see is, again, kind of the classical pattern that we see at the group level in 80 patients. Um, so we can see predominant hypometabolism in the posterior, um, um, uh, um, temporal and posterior parietal brain areas. And this is kind of the classical pattern that we see in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so this is nothing new, but it's kind of reassuring when you're doing statistics and you find the, the result that you're supposed to find. Um, so yeah, um, and here in B, I'm showing you um, the metabolism pattern with increasing staging of both amyloid and tau pathologies. And so you can see uh, kind of uh, widespread, but more mostly posteriorly 
um, uh, more hypometabolism with increasing staging of amyloid and tau, and it's even more true for tau. And I think it makes sense because we know that tau pathology is the pathology that is most related to um, neurodegeneration. So it makes sense that with increasing staging of uh, tau pathology, we see um, more uh, uh, regions that come up that are more hypometabolic. And again, this is this has been shown in previous findings. There's nothing new here, but it's kind of good to have this as sanity check and uh, that our results make sense with um, what we know from the literature. Um, here in A, I'm showing you the uh, unique contribution of uh, copathologies to the pattern of hypometabolism. So I'm only showing you the pathologies that were significant, and they kind of showed the same pattern, uh, which is more hypometabolism in the anteromedial uh, temporal brain regions. Um, so ATAC was significant, CAA, and latency. Um, and then if we look at CAA, it was also significant uh, using staging. Um, unfortunately, Lewy body disease was not significant using staging um, and was not significant also when we just looked at the presence of or, or absence. So after that, another thing that I did was that I computed region uh, of interest analyses. Um, and so the goal here was to um, extract um, the values in specific regions of interest uh, to verify if it's related to the presence of copathologies or specific copathologies. Um, so for instance, I looked at the Susan Landos at UC Berkeley uh, AD ROI. And so uh, this ROI includes uh, brain regions that are known to be affected in Alzheimer's disease. So it includes the angular, posterior cingulate and inferior temporal gyri. And so I included this ROI because I wanted to see first, is this AD ROI? Um, 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 more related to AD pathology, so amyloid and tau, but also is it related to specific uh, copathologies? Um, and then I also looked at the cingulate island sign. So as I mentioned earlier, the cingulate island sign is, um, is more prevalent in patients with Lewy body disease. And so my goal here was to see in patients with predominant AD pathology, those who have comorbid Lewy body disease, do they also show the cingulate island sign? So just as a reminder, the cingulate island sign is the relative preservation of the posterior cingulate gyrus on the, uh, uh, compared to the precuneus and cuneus. Um, then the third um, ROI that I included was the IMT ratio. So IMT stands for inferior temporal to medial temporal lobe. And uh, why did I include this ratio? Um, it, it was um, found in uh, 2018 from the Mayo group that um, patients with hippocampal uh, sclerosis have uh, relatively preservation of the inferior temporal lobe to the medial temporal lobe. And so they found that this uh, ratio uh, was indeed uh, able to discriminate between hippocampal sclerosis positive versus hippocampal sclerosis negative patients. Um, and so I wanted to see if, you know, our patients with AD who present with hippocampal sclerosis, but also latency because it's affecting uh, the same, uh, uh, it's involving similar brain areas. Is it also something that, um, uh, is able to discriminate patients with and without these diseases. And then a few years later, two years later from the same group, they showed that the IMT to supra, uh, frontal supraorbital ratio was even better than the IMT ratio, but this time at discriminate, discriminating TDP43 plus versus TDP43 negative patients. Um, and so I included also this ROI because I wanted to see um, if it's even better than this one at um, discriminating patients with in patients with AD, those who have a hippocampal sclerosis and latency versus uh, those who don't. Um, so first let's look at Suzanne Zlando AD ROI. Um, so again, sanity check, we found that indeed this AD ROI was associated with higher tall phases and BRAC stages. And so this is good news because this ROI, you know, is meant to include regions that are affected in Alzheimer's disease, and we found an association with AD pathology. 
We also found, interestingly, an association with hippocampal sclerosis um, and our tag. Um, so for hippocampal sclerosis, it could be, you know, it's involving the, um, some medial temporal regions. And so uh, uh, that could uh, explain why it's related to this uh, uh, ADROI. And interestingly, it was anti-correlated with the presence of Lewy body disease. And I think this is interesting because um, and makes sense because, you know, this ROI is supposed to detect AD pathology and be specific for AD pathology. So it makes sense that it's anti-correlated with another disease that is uh, supposedly targeting other brain areas. So that is not targeting these regions. Um, now, if we take a look at the singlet island sign, unfortunately, it was not uh, associated with any disease. Um, and with any pathology, it was anti-correlated with TAL, with BRAC, with AGD, and with RTAG. Um, and so I think, I, I, I'm not sure yet how to interpret this, these results, but I think that uh, because we're dealing with such small numbers, it might be a statistical limitation and maybe the direction is not necessarily that important. Um, I'm wondering if just the fact that it was associated with TAL, with BRAC, with HD and RTAG is something interesting. Um, but I, I have to think about this a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it was not associated with, um, with any uh, uh, pathologies. Uh, but I'm going to show you later uh, in the conclusion, but there's a study that was recently published and that showed that um, Patients with Lewy body disease show the singlet island sign, but in patients with AD and patients with AD and comorbid Lewy body disease, um, we don't really see the singlet island sign. So I'm wondering, you know, in uh, our sample of AD patients, maybe those with LBD pathology, um, um, you know, in uh, those who have LBD pathology, LBD is not playing a dominant role. It's just kind of in the background and AD is the one that is explaining most of the hypermetabolism pattern. So this is something that um, I, I think could explain why it was not associated with uh, LBD. Um, now, if we take a look at the IMT ratio, uh, kind of same results, we didn't find any positive associations. It was anti-correlated with TAL. Um, um, with uh, BRAC, with latency, hippocampal sclerosis, and RTAG. Um, I think what is interesting here is that it's the only ratio, if we compare with the ones that I showed you earlier, that was related um, with latency NHS. And this was kind of the goal. We wanted to see if the IMT ratio was uh, able to discriminate between latency, uh, patients with uh, comorbid latency and HS. Um, I'm not sure why the association was negative. I would have expected it to be positive. But again, I think that it might just be a statistical limitation because we're dealing with such small numbers, such small brain regions. And maybe here, the direction of the results is not that important. I think it's there's still something interesting about the fact that this IMT ratio was only um, was the only one um, compared to the first two ones that I've shown you that was related to latency and hippocampal sclerosis. And then the same thing, if we take a look at the IMT and supraorbital ratio, again, it was also negatively uh, associated with the presence of latency and hippocampal sclerosis. And remember, the goal of this ROI was to see if it was even better than the IMT ratio alone in discriminating patients with comorbid uh, hippocampal sclerosis and latency. And the results were a little bit more significant using this ROI. Again, I'm not not sure how we can interpret the results because the direction was negative, but I think it's still in interesting that this uh, ratio, uh, which is uh, uh, supposed to be good at discriminating latency and hippocampal sclerosis positive to negative patients, I think that it's interesting that these ratio uh, uh, were significant. So a few conclusions for this project. Um, First, the anterior medial temporal hypometabolism, we know from previous finding is a crucial marker of AD pathology. Um, so in uh, uh, patients with AD, we often see uh, hypometabolism in the anterior medial temporal lobe. But what we showed here is that um, the presence of anterior medial temporal hypometabolism seems to be also indicative of the presence of other common uh, co-pathologies in AD patients. 
and may be higher than expected, hypometabolism in these brain areas could be indicative of the presence of uh, comorbid pathologies. Um, in terms of the ROI analysis, I think that the uh, ADROI is really good at detecting AD pathology. And I think it's also interesting that it was negatively uh, associated with LBD. So I think it's very specific in detecting AD pathology. Uh, the CIS sign was not associated with LBD pathology. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a recent study that showed that um, in patients with comorbid Lewy body, in patients with AD who also have comorbid Lewy body disease, maybe the cingulate island sign is not that helpful and is not that present because AD could be the most dominant pathology that is explaining the symptoms and Lewy body disease is kind of present, but just in the background and doesn't impact the metabolism pattern so much. So I think that... Um, our results make sense with um, that paper that was published this year. So basically the singlet island sign could be more helpful in discriminating um, um, pure Lewy body disease and not when LBD is a co-pathology. Um, now, if we take a look at the results for the IMT ratio and the IMT frontal superorbital ratios, I think that it's still interesting that they were even if it was negatively, but that they were associated with latency and hippocampal sclerosis. I wonder if it's a statistical limitation. I have to keep thinking about that, um, but I think it's, it's still a, um, a result that is worth um, uh, mentioning. Um, and then the next step for this project will be for me to look at the associations between the pathology data, the fdg -PET sing signal, but this time cognition. And so I'm working on, on computing the um, uh, composite scores for cognition, and I will have hopefully uh, results very soon for, for that as well. Um, I wanted to end the presentation by um, uh, mentioning a few general take-home messages um, you know, like uh, to give you a better idea about of why we do the work that we do, why is it important, these projects on, on copathologies and um, the uh, why are we looking at the correlations between pathology in vivo markers and the symptoms. And I think that from the results I've shown you today, um, um, what we can conclude is that patients with neurodegenerative diseases rarely have pure presentations. Uh, if we think back of the results I've shown you for PCA, you can see that you know 95% of them had at least one, uh, one other cognitive domain that was affected. And I think that the fact that these um, syndromes are not that pure can be partly explained by the presence of multiple pathologies in their brain. The brain is complex. Um, so even in AD patients, yes, AD seems to be dominant and explain um, the majority of the symptoms, but there's still a lot of other pathologies that are present in these uh, definitely play a role in the symptomatology. And I hope I convinced you that better looking at in vivo markers like FDG can be helpful, or at least at the moment, to um, uh, uh, detect these pathologies in vivo. I think that a game changer will be uh, when we'll have new markers, new specific markers. Um, so stay tuned in the years and probably decade to come, we'll have amazing markers that will allow us to detect these copathologies. Um, and I think uh, this is going to be, uh, this is going to re revolutionize our field. Um, a second conclusion is that there isn't a perfect correlation between the symptomatology and underlying pathology. So I hope that's something that you'll keep in mind is that an amnestic presentation doesn't mean that the underlying pathology is Alzheimer's disease and vice versa. The odds uh, um, are, are definitely high. So if you have an amnestic presentation, remember that roughly in 76 or 80% of the cases, the underlying pathology is Alzheimer's disease, but it's not always the case. Um, so I think, again, studying closely the markers and the pathology can help us understand the symptomatology, help with differential diagno diagnosis and make predictions about prognosis. So how are these patients going to evolve over time? And lastly, you know, um, why do we do what we do? I think that better understanding the relationship between the symptoms, the brain patterns, and the underlying pathology will ultimately help uh, select eligible participants for um, clinical trials. You've probably heard in the news lately, um, we're really in an exciting era in terms of clinical trials related to AD. Um, there's a lot of molecules that are being tested. Some of them apparently are you know, helping slow cognitive decline. And I think that 
we have to keep in mind that co-pathologies are also present. And ultimately, I think we'll need medications that um, are able to target uh, multiple protein neuropathies. And uh, I think that um, this is a, an important take home um, uh, to keep into uh, consideration when we think about curing uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so that's it for the um, general take home. So I would like to thank um, you know, the funding agencies that either funded this project or that funded me, uh, my mentors, so Gil Rabinovich and Renaud Lajoie um, and everyone from the Rab Lab. We have a very um, uh, great team um, and this is, these projects are definitely a team effort. And all the centers that collaborated, especially for the PCA project, a lot of people collaborated and um, um, you know, this wouldn't have been possible without the help of all of these centers. And lastly, thank you all so much for listening. And um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Or if you're, you know, shy to ask them here, you can definitely email me and I, I, I'll be happy to chat with you and um, answer any questions that, that you may have. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. Merci beaucoup, Marianne. A great presentation as always. Uh, that was, it's, I mean, it's a very exciting topic and it, personally a topic that I, I really love uh, listening and talking about. <laughs> so definitely uh, interesting. Um, so feel free to drop in the chat any questions that you want uh, for Marianne. I'll also try to keep an eye on the, on the physical room uh, so that uh, if uh, people want to ask uh, questions, you can raise your hand as well. Uh, I do have a question uh, from the chat. So uh, the question um, is, so the person is asking, were the per participants included in her study mainly only recruited from studies originally designed to study uh, Alzheimer's disease patient? If yes, could you explain, uh, could that explain the high percentage of comorbidity with Alzheimer's disease pathology? And could it be a bias of the inclusion exclusion criteria at the level of each site included in, her, uh, in your study? Uh, or do you think that the total sample size is representative of all individuals with PCA. Question, yeah, this is a really good question. So if I understood correctly, um, is the question that, you know, some of these centers at least included PCA patients when the underlying pathology was AD. Is that is that the question? Because yes, this is a, an issue, definitely a limitation of, of the project. So some centers, you know, in, um, would diagnose PCA disease only if the underlying pathology was Alzheimer's disease. So yes, that might have skewed, you know, the 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 finding we found about the underlying AD pathology in PCA um, towards uh, this pathology because some centers would not diagnose a, a PCA when um, the underlying pathology was not AD. But I I, I still I, I think. It's still a good representation because first, these were mostly data from the 90s, like the, the, when we had that problem, these were data from the 90s, and we had a lot of newer data. So I think, yes, maybe a small portion of our sample um, presented that limitation, but in general, I, I don't think it did. I, I think, um, you know, the patients that were included in the study were diagnosed based on the most recent uh, diagnostic criteria, which include that no matter what the underlying pathology we think is, um, uh, they will still receive the diagnosis. And kind of a sanity check for that um, is that we had a lot of patients who received the diagnosis of PCE plus. So let's say we, uh, you know, about 20 something percent. So I think that if all of our sample received the diagnosis of PCA pure, we might have been like, mm, maybe they didn't include the most complex cases. But I think that the fact that we found so much uh, complex associations kind of show that we had a, a, a diverse sample, if that makes sense. But that was a great question. All right, uh, we have another question from the chat. So Yara is asking, uh, thanks for the uh, nice presentation, Marianne. What additional information does the DAT scan provide? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the DAT scan basically is helpful to uh, detect uh, Lewy body disease. It's a kind of an in vivo marker that we have uh, that, that clinicians have for Lewy body disease. Uh, it's not always used, and but we, we knew sometimes it is. And so we wanted to see, you know, is this, um, is this uh, uh, related to uh, PCA in some ways? 
And I, I didn't discuss the results for that because I think there was a big bias for, for, for what we found. So we found that 50% of patients with PCA received uh, the, the, the PCA patients who received the DAT scan, 50 something percent of them received a positive DAT scan. But the reason why neurologists in the first place will ask for a DAT scan, it's because they think that there might be comorbid Lewy body disease or predominant Lewy body disease in PCA patients. And so there's definitely a bias to why um, the DAT scans were, were um, more than half, uh, in, in more than half of the sample positive. So um, uh, yeah, but th this is kind of the, the purpose of, of that scan. All right, I see a hand raised in the room, uh, so you have the floor. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, for the hypometabolism, you measure with FDG PET. I'm wondering if you interpret that those effects being mostly driven by you know, loss of neuro neurons or loss of neuronal activity, or is there other uh, possible mechani mechanisms that can like influence hypometabolism? For example, like uh, vascular dysfunction with kind of like blood flow and reduce the, the metabolism there? Yeah, that's a really good question. So my understanding is that FDG PET is really more specific for neurodegeneration. And we know that from studies looking at the associations between hypometabolism and, for instance, atrophy patterns using MRI. Um, and I'm not sure with vascular diseases and so on. I'm sure there are studies that you know show correlations between hypometabolism and some other metrics. But um, I don't know how specific it is. And if it's more specific than atrophy, my guess would be not. Um, I think FDG is really uh, specific for neurodegeneration, but there might be other factors playing a role for sure. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the right answer is actually. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we have one more question in the chat from uh, Maxime Montembeau. Uh, amazing presentation, Marianne. I was very surprised to hear that behavioral symptoms were the most frequent additional symptoms in PCA patients. To be honest, I would have expected them to be uh, the least frequent when compared to language, ex executive, or memory. I'm curious to hear more about this and how you plan to investigate this further. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. I was super surprised too. And I think that, you know, if we think about um, behavioral changes, the first thought I, I was thinking was, oh my God, is it you know behavioral uh, uh, symptoms as we see in BVFTD patients? So kind of personality changes, you know, very more kind of frontal symptoms. And I think it's probably anxiety and depression. But you know, this is really just a speculation. Um, but if we think about PCA patients, you know, the level of an an anosognosia is usually low. And so they, they kind of are aware of their symptoms. So I, I'm wondering if it's anxiety and depression related to the fact that they see their cognition changing and the visual symptoms being more and more prominent. Uh, but this is really just a hypothesis. And um, I'm working on a project right now uh, in collaboration with Nurian Irish and um, Siddharth Ramanan uh, uh, in the UK, where we, uh, in the UCSF database, we're looking at the um, uh, components that are clustering together in PCA patients, um, including um, the behavioral changes. And so I wanna see if this is something that is coming up in PCA patients at the Mac only. So we're really using just the uh, UCSF Memory and Aging Center uh, data set. But um, yeah, I, I wonder if it's related to anxiety and depression uh, mostly. All right, thank you for your answer. Um, I see that we are now at uh, 12. I don't know, Malar, if you we should stop here or and push for the student discussion afterwards, the rest of the questions, or? I think this, there's this last one, which should be pretty um, usable to answer, and then let's, let's move on after this, which should be the last question. All right, so the last question from uh, Ricky asking, uh, thanks for that really interesting talk. I was wondering if you have considered monopause-related hormone changes as a contributing factor to the heightened prevalence of PCA in females. And relatedly, do you have any information about hormone replacement therapy in your patients uh, of Project One? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I think this is a very you know novel and trendy topic. And this is not something I, I, I had available, but yeah, it, it could definitely play a role. And I think this is an exciting um, topic to 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 keep into consideration and, and uh, study. 
yeah. All right, uh, then we're going to stop it here. Uh, but anyone interested to ask more questions to Marianne can uh, stay and uh, for the student student discussion happening right after. Uh, but again, uh, thank you, Marianne, for uh, such an amazing talk and giving uh, giving us your time this morning. And I hope, uh, yeah, we were able to make you feel a little bit less uh, homesick. <laughs> thank you again. Great talk. Thanks a lot.